Hi, Lauren. How are you? It's oh, so exciting to be here. I am so excited to meet you and to be able to connect with you and to delve into your incredible books. So I just, I have been counting down. Well, me too. And I think that we are kindred spirits. Uh, I, I feel the same. I, you know, I was telling, I was telling, as I told you before, this latest book of yours is just so stunning. I mean, from the first few, you know, from the first page and um, I have so many questions about your research process and how you possibly construct these novels in a way that bring to life these wonderful sisters and take us into this part of history that, you know, I didn't, I, I, I didn't know anything about it. That is just what's so amazing. But maybe we should remember, we, maybe we should start a little bit. We should backtrack. Do you think we should? That sounds like a good idea because we were talking about um, how, you know, as kids, neither of us were um, big readers. Uh, and, but we were both inspired by the same author, which is really unusual. And it's also an unusual author to be inspired by. I'm dyslexic and I, I taught myself how to read after failing grade four. Um, when I was nine years old, I read Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. And what was your the first big book that you ever read. Well, it's so funny you should mention grade four because that was one of my worst years, grade four and five. And I did not read a book until cover to cover till I was 14. And I don't, I don't really, I don't think it's dyslexia. I was never really diagnosed, although I have a lot of the same, you know, reversing. It's very hard for me to learn a foreign language. I have memory issues. So when I read things, I forget them very quickly. And it was always really hard for me to sequence. I would get confused in books and in movies. And my first book was by Charles Dickens <laughs> called A Tale of Two Cities. Also, you said, I read on your website that you said that you just challenged yourself and you took the thickest book you could <laughs> out of the library. And, and I did a similar thing in that I just looked at that Charles Dickens book when I was 14. And, and I, th I thought to myself, this was our English assignment for, you know, for my 10th grade English. And I thought, if I don't figure out how to read, then I don't know what's going to happen. And I'm sure you felt that same feeling. So I read that book by reading, reading every paragraph two or three times and taking notes. So do you have your copy of Oliver Twist proudly on your, on your I, shelf? I book? do not. I do not because it was a library book. And I, ah. I kept on taking it out uh, and renewing it and renewing it. And it fell apart by the end of the year. And uh, the librarian was not mad at me. She said, I can fix it, but it wasn't my book to keep. So it's at, I, it's probably thrown out now because it was at the Brantford Public Library. But well, I feel um, like when, when we start the Marsha Museum, we're going to have to find <laughs> that book and it's going to be under in a glass case. <laughs> it's going to be a very important artifact. But one of the th reasons that I could read that book, and I'm curious to see if this is similar to you, is that uh, I couldn't cheat with it. Because before that, they would give me simpler and simpler books because I was just, um, they, no one told me back then that I was dyslexic. I was just a slow learner. So they kept on giving me simpler and simpler things. And I could cheat because I could guess. I was really good at guessing and making up stories. So I could stand up and pretend that I read it and then they'd correct a few words. And that was okay because I'd memorized the rest from listening to other people. But with... Um, Oliver Twist, I couldn't guess. And the only way that I could get through the book was to start on page one and have it right side up with what, I, like with other books, sometimes I'd hold it in the mirror and read backwards or read it upside down just to almost as a party trick because I got invited to birthday parties if I could do weird things. Um, so <laughs> it forced me to read it um, from page one on. And it was the first time when I was reading that I got a movie in my head. And I have to say that when I was reading your new book, right from page one, I had a movie in my head. That's such a nice thing to say, Marsha, because that's my goal. And I, I so relate to what you just said, because when I was reading A Tale of Two Cities and all these I, is, I remember it was the first time that I actually I cl would climb into bed. I'd never done that before with a book. And it was this, that exact same feeling of the first time of really being um, pu pulled into a story. Yes. And having those words turn into pictures and feel like I was being carried along. So I'm. Um, and that you were the main character. Yes. Yeah. And then, so this is what you do in your books is you make the person reading it 
a main character. And what I love about your writing is that you have such deep respect for your reader because I despise books that talk down to young readers. I write, and I'm sure that you do too, I write for young people because I like an intelligent reader. And a lot of adults are reading just for pleasure. They're not reading to make themselves um, more informed. They're not reading for any reason except pleasure, which is okay. I'm an adult. I read for pleasure. But I really, really love to have kids because they're such a sophisticated audience. You do not talk down to anyone. But I am just so impressed because like, so this is how thick your book is. <laughs> this is how thick my book is. Yes, I was you doing that too. Yours is way thicker and you heavier. Have just, but you have just as much story. And be, before the, 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 the camera came on, I was saying that for me, my writing process, it feels like I'm putting helium in a balloon and then I'm standing on the balloon trying to make it smaller because I overwrite and then I have to cut back. And I'm wondering whether, what's your process? Do you do that or... Like, because I think that you are more organized than me. Oh my gosh. No, it is not true at all. In fact, we could have a dueling. I, I'm so relieved to hear that. Although I do see post-it notes, Marsha. Um, and I'm, and I'm jealous of that because, and that's a question that writers get all the time. Like, what is your process? And, and I just have to admit that I have the most messy, chaotic, um, just every, it, I have to kind of write myself through, you know, into every phase of the book. I can't discover the character until I fully write maybe half of the book. And I That's sometimes me. get to that. And it's just, it's very inefficient, Marsha. We must. It is very it's inefficient. Terribly these, inefficient. These post-it notes are, are my, um, uh, I'm trying to reform. And I also, I just bought the very first how to write book I've ever bought because I'm just so ticked off with myself because the, the book that I'm writing right now, I have just taken out 85,000 words of a 40,000 word book. <laughs> I can't even imagine it. You know who we need to get on here with us, who's an Asheville native, native and he's probably not far, is Alan Gratz. I don't know if you have done any events with Alan. I have he likes, behind him, he has all of his index card and he used to have a level. So he would actually have them meticulously lined up and he outlines his entire book on wow. index cards, chapter by chapter. And they he keeps them on a wall. So I'm finally staring behind him when we're zooming together, trying to like get his process. But I do think that much in the way that you and I both had to figure out our way to read, I think each writer has their own process and you know, I am waiting. I'm, I keep, I would, I think it would be so welcoming to be able to just for some, for, to finally have something click and to say, okay, that's, I'm going to, you know, map out every chapter and my character arc is like this and the plot is like this and the history, all the plot, you know, all the facts get sort of lined up. It just doesn't work that way. Um, but yours, I mean, I will say that I think that I see you know, I have recommended your books to a lot of my older readers because I feel like, you know, I've written about the Nazis. I, I did write about the Holocaust and I've written about World War II. Um, and I feel as though the background that I can give my readers, these young readers who are maybe getting their fo first exposure to some of these events can, you know, you of course explain everything very beautifully, but there's a complexity. You, you deserve to have thicker books. Um, <laughs> and I think, you know, there's a sophistication to your, um, and, and it's just um, your, your, your just the, the lives of what your characters are going through is even more harrowing, I think, than what I put my poor characters through. Um, it's really, it's incredible. And I do, I would really do want to, well, first of all, can I ask you a little bit about your research process? As long um, as I can ask back because I'm so absolutely curious. Absolutely can. So let me hear, I mean, can we do a little synopsis of this book um, before, you know, for people who haven't been able to read it yet? It's, would you like me to do the synopsis? Or sure. Would you like I want to hear what you, okay. um, how so, you synopsize. So this was, this is a very, this is what was so harrowing for me about your book. And, and Marcia, it, it connects to something that I think about all the time when I'm writing the stories that I write. So you would think the two sisters, two, you know, two Ukrainian sisters during World War II, they make it through the war. I mean, they lose their mother, but they, they, they are able to survive this, you know, Nazi, the Nazis, 
They go through, I mean, uh, you know, unspeakable things. And you would think now the war's over, the Americans have come, they are in a camp where the Americans are watching over them. So you think, I made it. And that's chapter page one. <laughs> and they haven't made it because now the Soviets have, have come in and they are taking, they are basically kidnapping um, mm -hmm. young people who they suspect could be threats in the future and putting them into these terrible places. The term silence camp is just such, I mean, what a, I've never heard that term before. And 10,000 young people were put into these camps. Most did not, you know, were either shot or died there. And the idea that, and this was a part of history that you, as I read in your afterward, was not illuminated until 1990, it was kept secret. Mm -hmm. So how did you come across this story? Um, you know, how the, now, that now, now I'm ready to hear about your research. Well, um, I am of Ukrainian heritage. I was born in Canada and I actually don't speak Ukrainian. Being dyslexic, it's actually hard for me to learn other languages. I can read other languages, but it's hard for me to speak them. Uh, but uh, my own great grandmother and my um, great aunt were both, uh, they both survived World War II, but they were killed right after by the Soviets. And I couldn't figure that out. And in fact, like I went to Ukraine, I, myself, I went to the, the their birth village, like just trying to figure out how that could be and why. And uh, so in many ways, writing uh, Traitors Among Us was a very personal experience because it was just trying to sort out things that I had been told. And I still don't know exactly what happened to my, um, my own family. I know that my great aunt was in the underground and she was shot and buried in a mass grave. I know that. And I know that her mother was then sent to Siberia in retribution for what her, her daughter had done. But that's all that I know. And that is just what came from word of mouth all the way to Canada from people who came from that area and heard it word of mouth. Um, but then when I was doing um, interviews of people who had lived through World War II uh, in, you know, to write Making Bombs for Hitler and all my other books that are set in World War II, over and over and over again, it was the fear of the Soviets more than the Nazis that Ukrainians would talk about, which just blew my mind. And it wasn't something that was in books. So uh, I had to do a lot of original research and I do um, uh, speak a lot to survivors. And also these survivor accounts tend not to be published because the way that people who are Eastern European cope is by uh, not talking about it ever again. And so over a couple decades, uh, families would, like I would do a presentation of a book because I did my first World War II book in 2001. So when I was presenting that book at like sometimes old age homes where there were Ukrainians there, and then when um, uh, an elderly person who'd lived through this died, the family would give me letters, copies of letters. They'd make copies of letters or memoirs or diaries for the daughter, the son, and Marsha. So I just get mailed these but they didn't want anything to be said until after they died. And so like just accumulating all this and this whole thing about this fear of the Soviets. And then um, I knew that so many people ended up in the gulags, but I did not know up until recently that there was a, a gulag system worse than the gulag, the so silence camps, right where um, uh, the Nazis had been. So the Nazis had vacated those concentration camps and then right behind them, the Soviets came and set up things right behind them. And they were doing um, pretty horrific things too. And it's not even that they were doing a denazification program. Because right, right. they actually used former Nazis to help them patrol things. They were interested in anybody who could be um, in opposition to them. Because they also had a dictatorial regime, right? A genocidal dictatorial regime. But because we were allied with them, we didn't get that information. Because I think... Um, in some ways, the other allies were sh ashamed of what they did, but they had no choice because, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend right. and you couldn't fight the Soviets and the Nazis at the same time. And if they hadn't allied with the Soviets, then um, World War II would not have been won. But right. the unfortunate thing is World War II was not won by people who lived on the ground there. So the war continued, I would say, even to today, because Russia is currently fighting Ukraine to this day is, you know, 
Crimea has been taken, the whole border area has been taken. So um, everybody else got to, you know, go home and write ha happily ever and after and the end. So I wanted to write about this and write about it from the point of view of two young people who were caught up in that. I, um, I didn't want them to go all the way to a silence camp because honestly, the chances of them getting out would be right. almost impossible. Right. So they're still at the interrogation house. But I had a ton of first person accounts of interrogation houses and a few of silence camps. So the information is out there. It's just that you have to, you know, you have to know to look. Well, I think what's so, what's so sad, you know, what's the, what I think we're learning more and more is that, you know, we want, you know, a World War II in our, the way we like to think of it is the bad guy lost, we won, we got together, it was over and people were freed. Yes. And we don't, you know, the complexities and the nuances of, of, of that mess um, are, as you said, you know, are still reverberating and it's much, um, it's, you know, it's, it's very hard to, um, to fully comprehend that, you know, that, um, and, and for people, I think to even, um, want to think about that because, um, this sort of good versus evil, good one, the idea that we had to ally with the Soviets in order to beat Hitler, but then it unleashed, this horror um, that but, I mean, there there was no other way around it, and yeah. I have such yeah. respect for um, um, Americans who fought, Canadians yeah. who fought, British who fought, um, because they gave their lives up to yes. try and fix this. And uh, the other thing too is that when you live in a democracy like we do, you can't even fathom that people can be so horrible to other people. So you know, it, it's because of our own innate. Um, uh, democratic ideals that right. you can't recognize that. But I want to go on to this book. I survived the Galveston hurricane, 1900. I did not know anything about this hurricane. And I, um, first of all, I want to talk about the format of the book because I'm all about format because I'm dyslexic. So when I picked up this book, the first thing that I did was I turned to the back because that's what I, I do, because there's no front and back when you're dyslexic. And I am just so thrilled that you have done this thing where you talk about the real people you've got, keep reading and you do these in all these books. And this is what I mean about respecting your audience because you have this story that plunges the reader in and a boy character, boy in history, like 10 stars right there because like boys get, you know, pegged as non-readers. They're not non-readers, they're just discerning readers. But a discerning reader will pick up this book and will be plunged into this story and not feel that they're being talked down to. But then boy readers really like facts and figures. You've given this to them. Like, just congratulations. Well, and it's also, it's just so alluring. I mean, like even on the cover, this kid's drowning. This well, it's funny, you know, it's, it's interesting that you say, you know, the sort of the, the back part of it is that's why, you know, when I'm finished, just like you, I don't have 80,000 extra words or whatever. <laughs> you, um, but I always, when I finish reading, writing a book, I have so much more I want to share with my kids. I feel like I want them all gathered around me and go, okay, there's so much more I have to tell you about what happened afterwards to the city of Galveston. You know, I think that there are so many questions in my books that I can't, that I don't get to answer in the story. And and that yes. is one of the things that I really try to do in my I Survive books. And you're right in that I'm trying to, I do tons of research. I visit every place that I write about. There's only been two places in the 22 books, 21 books. I'm just starting the 22nd that I haven't visited. I haven't visited Japan because I wasn't able to do that when I was writing about the tsunami. And I didn't go to the bottom of the ocean to see the Titanic, but everywhere else I've gone. Um, so I can really walk in the footsteps of my characters and listen to stories that have been passed down and go to museums and all of those things that I'm, that I know you do as well. Um, but I'm, my real goal is to, to tell, to help kids maybe who don't love to read to, but are, who are curious, who are ready to be fascinated, um, to, to help them access these complicated stories. And all of the stories in my series are about events that in some way changed our ideas about things or yes. changed 
history. So this is just this was just such an interesting story because I mean the Galveston hurricane in 1900 is still the deadliest natural disaster in American history. Mo many people outside Texas haven't really heard of it unless you read the wonderful book by Eric Larson, Isaac Storm, for you know for for adults, um, which really put this storm on the map. And Isaac Klein, who is, was the, the the weather expert in Galveston, who said famously that a dangerous hurricane could never hit. Galveston and mm -hmm. help give this sense of security. So there were just so many things about the story that were important. Um, Galveston was the fastest growing city in Texas, one of the fastest growing cities in the world, more millionaires in Galveston in 1900 than almost anywhere else in the country. And it was on track to become the third largest city. It was over to, it was overtaking Houston and it had its port and all these immigrants coming in and these incredible commercial, you know, industry people loved living there. It was beautiful. Why wouldn't we'd love to live there in 1900, Absolutely. but it was terribly vulnerable to storms. And so, um, it, you know, this, it, it was hit by a storm that 20 feet of water on both sides swallowed up the city for a few hours. And when those waters went away, there was just wreckage, a, 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 miles and miles of mountains of wreckage. Um, they did rebuild the city and, um, and they actually, in one of the greatest achievements of engineering, they actually raised the city up in the years after so that it would be less vulnerable and they built this huge seawall. So the city is still there and it's a lovely place to go visit, but it never, um, it never, you know, Houston quickly overtook it. What I think is so interesting is that back in 1900, Galveston had about 50,000 people. Today it has 60,000. Wow. Houston is, I think, five or 6 million, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, so it's just, right. um, it really never, it never recovered. So, uh, you know, very, very interesting. And thank you for your kind words um, because I really am. Um, I have, I just love, I love connecting with my readers and I love, I feel like I'm on sort of a shared journey with them. Well, um, it's, it's very yeah. apparent and it's also such visual writing, but I want to know what scene you wrote first. Wait, can I, can I, can I just take my turn to, to like, to um, love your book for a second? Because <laughs> I wanted to say one of the, one, you're not going to believe one of my favorite scenes in this book. And I think this speaks to something really important about your writing and about what I think what we're both trying to do, although you do it so well, and I'm going to be studying this scene for a long time, just because I learn from, I'm going to turn you into my teacher. But, um, the scene where the, the scene where she is bathing um, for the first time, it was, it's chapter, let's see where this is, um, where she is, she has, she's, Maria is filthy. She hasn't bathed in months her, I just, just, and I'm thinking about as a child, you know, as, as a teenager, what could be worse? a teenage girl, what could be more horrifying? Your, your hair is filled with lice and scabs. You haven't, you're just, your skin is caked. You have not bathed in months. And then you are given the opportunity to, to sit with a bar of soap and a basin of water. And this scene goes on and on, Marsha. And you just take us through and then looking for clean clothes. And to me, it just, it, 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 as a reader, it's, it enabled me to connect in such a, in such an important way to your, this character, I could relate so much. And you do that so beautifully, you sort of toggle between these unimaginable things that we can't even fathom. And then these everyday experiences that every child can connect to. And I think that that's, I mean, I'm sure that, I mean, I think that I, tr I struggle with that a lot myself in trying to create, you know, characters from history, but I really want my, my, my readers to feel as though um, they're in their shoes. I want them to feel as though this is a person they'd be friends with, they, they would, that they can completely connect to. So I just thought that was a my, just so beautifully done. Oh, thank, and, thank you. But you know, remember, we've got a slightly different age that we're yes, writing. For. Yes. So yes. if if you had done something like that, I think that you would have put your reader to sleep. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think that you want to do a lot of that. Yeah. Like what, what I try and do is um, 
give the reader a little bit of a break because what the girls had been going through was so harrowing. And so I felt that I needed just a rest as even um, I needed my soul to have a bandage on it right. uh, from writing the things that I had to put my characters through. Um, and I mean, especially some of the things that had just happened. And so for me, that purification and her, her opportunity to have a transformation and then also to make the underwear out of the Nazi flag, you right. know, that was, <laughs> <laughs> I really liked doing that. Um, and I, I mean, because she had just suffered so much and it was just, I don't know, poetic justice for me, but, um, uh, I cannot write in order at all when I'm writing. You were asking before. So you, so tell me, so you start, you were, where do you start? This, this book, actually, I did start on page one only because it's the third um, with uh, Maria and Christia. So because I knew the characters really well, I was able to start on page one. But when I wrote, don't tell the Nazis, I started on like four fifths in, and then I wrote backwards and then I wrote the ending. So I, I, I try that. You know, I, I think like as I told you, I'm always open to new ideas. I actually start with chapter two because my chapter one is always, you know, this sort of preview cliffhanger. It's one of okay. my little formulas. And that sure. started because when I my first I survived book, I wrote about the Titanic. And I thought I, I started writing the, the book and I want to really grab these readers attention and engage them. And I'm picturing my son, Dylan, and his friend, Ben, and his friend, you know, um, Scott, like who don't like to read like the problem with the Titanic is it's actually super dull. Like if you, you know, the, you get on, you get on the ship, you eat the food, you walk on oh, the Oh, yes, track, right. The ladies yeah. with their dresses, you know, they're like, there's like some croquet maybe or I don't know, horseshoes. So I thought, and so, and I, and it, nothing really exciting happens until they hit the iceberg, you know, on day three of the journey. So I started reading this book to my, my I had, a, I had about four or five chapters and I thought, this is just very dull. What am I going to do? I mean, I'm just, this is how am I going to really grip these kids? And so I read the book and I mortified my son by asking if I could read it aloud to him and his friend, like, you know, they were on like outside in the basketball in the driveway and I dragged them in. They were, you know, 10 years old or whatever. And his Dylan's friend said he was very polite, but I could tell he was hiding something. And I said, tell me what it is. Tell me, tell me, please. He said, can't you just start with some action? So I thought, well, how do I start with some action? Because if you start like, and then that's when I realized. So chapter one is the last chapter I write. I finish the whole book and then I'm like, oh, I'm done. No, I'm not. I have to write chapter one. And so I go in and I find an exciting scene and I rewrite it and I add some background because I'm also trying to give, I want to help kids sort of ground themselves a little sure. bit in the first year. Like, where are you? Who is this? What's been happening? You know, just so they're kind of have that in their heads when they plunge into then chapter two, which is the first chapter I write, which is such a bear chapter two and three, because that's really where I'm laying out. I mean, you do this beautifully. You set the scene so incredibly well. I mean, the the woman with the, I, I won't give it away because I don't know if there are any very young children in the audience here, but with the woman with their infant on her back, you know, just right. setting it up so so quickly. Um, but but chapter two and three, really for me, I will spend maybe two months noodling, you know, back and forth. And, you know, because that's really to me, the blueprint. And I lay all the groundwork of who my character is, what my character is going to be dealing with aside from this disaster, um, the family, what, and it just, that's, I, you know, I, I love the idea though, of really starting with a pivotal scene to sort of test to see who your character is. And then maybe, maybe that would be, so I'm going to try it this time, Marsha with 22, and I'm going to see what happens and I'm going to let you know. But I, I kind of like your idea better. I, I would really <laughs> like to write a book, you know, go forward like that and then write the first chapter. I think that that would be a very satisfying way. And that's very organized, I have to tell you. Oh, it's I don't know. See, like I write something in the middle because I don't know the character yet. So sometimes yeah. they will only tell me certain things about themselves. So I find the scene that is the most vivid in my head. And that's the one that I write. And I then think... totally out of you know, order or anything else, then I write another one. And then sometimes they start to be like raindrops and make a puddle. And then I get an idea of their order. But then also I get an idea of ones that don't belong in that book at all. And so 
That's why I end up with trilogies. I never know that I'm writing a trilogy. <laughs> I know. I just, I saw on your website that you're like, oh, well, I think this is going to be a trilogy. <laughs> that's, I love that. I think that's, I think that's a wonderful trademark. Well, I think, you know, was the other, I don't know if this happens to you, but this happens to me and it's very exciting, but also it's very frustrating because I never, I can't make it happen. It's like this weird magical thing that just some, somehow happens when the character, when I, it's like, okay this is the, this, this, there's something, I have an idea that that lights up my character in my mind. So for me, it was Charlie. Charlie's my main character in the Galveston book. And I just, I, I really wanted Charlie to be obsessed with magic and magicians because, Mm -hmm. um, that was such a huge thing in 1900, the golden age of magic. I mean, these magicians were bigger celebrities than today would be LeBron James meets some YouTube influencer meets, you know, you know, Simone Biles, you know, who, you know, just he was so famous and the idea of being able to do magic tricks and all of this. But I also, it was the moment where I pictured Charlie at a magic show. Cause I had gone to Galveston and they had a theater there in Galveston. And I pictured him kind of going and not really being that excited, you know, um, maybe, or, you know, just going and then see like that moment of like being a kid who's maybe smaller than the other kids at school, who doesn't have a ton of friends, Mm -hmm. um, who's a little scared of this mean kid named Gordon Potts and the power of the magician on the stage and seeing this person in command and this feeling of that's what I'm going to do. And that was when I, when that image came into my mind, I was able then to go into chapter two and three and sort of lay the groundwork of Charlie, um, you know, being this sort of secretly in his room, practicing his card tricks and his, right. um, and his, and his thing. So it's just funny. It just doesn't happen in an organized way. I think we're both, I think that's, I'm, I'm very happy. And I'm, I don't like that you suffer in your process, but I am taking some, I'm feeling because of, you know, I feel, as you said, I feel we're kindred spirits. We are, we're absolutely kindred spirits. A lot of times when I'm writing, it's it's like I'm taking the veils off my character to try and find out who they really are. And I keep on reminding myself, I keep on having to ask myself, what does this person want? What do they need? What do they love? Um, Those and- are exactly the questions I ask, Marsha. Really? That's that is such a, yep. Not, I don't have it as eloquently in my head, but that's it's, those are the same those are the same questions. Well, when I start to write myself off off the ledge, which happens way too often because I have no sense of direction, that's what I have to pull myself back and ask myself that. But also uh, other characters too, because um, I, the way that I write, sometimes I think it's like, do you know what, what a buckthorn tree is? They have branches and they go in too many directions and you have to pull the whole thing out. And that's how I feel I write sometimes because it's, it starts out normal and then it just keeps on going all over the place and I have to pare it down. But I keep on telling myself that I won't put someone in unless I know as much about them as I do about my main character. And if I don't know that, then they don't deserve to be there and just get rid of them and combine them maybe with someone else. I, I think that's so true. I, in fact, one of the things my husband always tells me when I'm coming in, you know, after a frustrating day or waking up at 4.30 and just like falling back into bed at 10, because I'm just... Um, he often says to me, it sounds like you have too much, too yes. much. And, you know, and I'll be like, no, that's not true. I love, you know, <laughs> I resist it, but it's true. And I think that that's such a good way of putting it. The other question I do ask myself, in addition to the three that you said is what does my character think is funny? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> so, like you know, that. so, you know, what is, what amuses them? Like what makes them laugh? Um, and what also melts their heart a little bit, because, you know, so what is, because you want, you know, the characters are often very stoic, but there's always a little something. It's the little sister or, you know, some, some teacher, you know, that they quietly admire, but won't admit it. So mm-hmm. there are different ways, I guess, that we can bring our characters to life. Um, but I think you both, we both just have to go through the, I like the, I'm going to think of, I'm going to look up the buck tree after I get off with <laughs> buckthorn. You, you will buckthorn, hate them. Oh, the buckthorn. They're absolutely horrible. And you can't even pull them up because they've got these hidden thorns in them. Oh my gosh. It you sounds terrible. They're evil. They're evil. So tell, can you tell me a little bit about what you're working on now? The, what I'm working on right now, it's called winter kill. And it's set in Ukraine um, before the war. And it's uh, during a time uh when uh stalin is actually um it's the 
the beginning of the whole of more when he decides that an entire group of people are the enemy and he is starving them to death. So oh it's again, it's something that people don't know about. And um, uh, it's this huge bite that I'm taking, but also it's this huge bite that I'm taking that is um, massive, but nobody knows about it. And so that's why it just keeps on exploding on me. And I can't do it as a single book because anyone who has written on this topic has simplified it to the point that I would call it genocide porn. Right. Oh my goodness. And I'm not going to do that. And I don't think that's respectful to the people who went through it. Uh, there's a lot of Holocaust literature that I would say is the same thing. And I, I, um, I, I dislike people who write that kind of thing, because I think that you have to have a lot of respect and love for the people that you write about and don't just write about them so that you can write about horrors. I, I um, still agree. I mean, that, that's such, I, I can't, I can't tell you how much I, you know, I think about that all the time. I think that, you know, I get letters from people and I'm sure you do too, um, who've been personally impacted by wildfires, you know, floods, tornadoes. And, um, and I, you know, I've been twice, I've written books about real places at the invitation of people from the communities come, we want to share our stories. And it's always a very interesting and, and some, and I'm um, deeply, um, um, you know, I always worry a little bit. I think, you know, okay, I'm going to, I paradise. California was a community that I visited twice at the invitation of a family there and visited schools. And a lot of kids asked for me to write about the wildfires, but because mm -hmm. I wasn't there during the wildfires, I do, I, I, I resist, I always resist the idea at first, but on the, at the same time, I, what I hear over and over is, and I think this is what you're doing, is that people want their stories shared, that these events, um, they, they, and that, you know, and that doesn't mean that people want to tell their, their own story. It's but, too painful. Yeah. But the idea it's of making sure that people know and, you know, kind of honoring the experience of people who've endured these events and doing yes. it in a way that's very, you know, trying to be as respectful as possible. And, and also generating empathy, which is something that you do so well. And, but generating empathy instead of just titillation. Right. And I think also that's one reason that I write for young people and I suspect you do too, because young people, when they're reading a book and they're reading a historical book, it's because they want to be plunged into that time. They're not reading it as a distraction. Right. They're reading it as the opposite of distraction to experience that. And, you know, like the brain chemistry changes that happen to a reader also happen to someone who experiences it. And I would rather have a kid, um, you know, read your book than have to go through that experience, right? But they get the same empathy. They learn the same amount because their brain reacts the same way. And that's the beauty of writing. And also that's the beauty of writing about this kind of thing. And a lot of people, they probably said it to you, they've said it to me. Why do you write about such serious things for children? Uh, you know, why don't you write about helium balloons? Well, I am, but that's beside the point. Um, but it, it, it's, it's because this is what they need. And because we respect our reader enough to share with them and to trust them with such serious subjects. I'll, 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 I'll definitely echo that. And I will underscore it because I say that all the time. I once got an email from a child who said, dear Mrs. Tarshish, why do you write about things that are so depressing with a U D U P R E S S I N G. And I thought about that, you know, I do it, you know, how, why, um, and for me, it's also, and I think the empathy piece is huge. I also, I don't know if this is, I'm afraid to ask you this question because I've asked it of a few authors, history authors, and um, not everyone feels the way I do, but I somehow, I find that reading, and my, my, my mother-in-law who lived with me for 10 years, in fact, these are many of her books behind me. Most of them are in my office upstairs. Um, she was, she, she fled Germany in 1939 and ended up in the Jewish ghetto in Shanghai, um, and lost most of her family members in the Holocaust oh my and gosh. died a few years ago, um, at the age of 97 and was a very joyful, I used to wake up in the middle of the night cause I would have insomnia and she, she has a, she had an apartment off our living room that we built for her. 
And I would hear this noise coming from her at two in the morning. And it was her on the phone with her friend Hilda in Rome, who she was in the ghetto with laughing. And the idea that you could go through, you can, that time and time again, and I'm sure you feel, you see it all the time. I meet people who've gone through these harrowing experiences and yet they are able to go on. Yeah. Not yeah, to say like, they're yeah. not haunted and that you don't have scars and that you don't, but you can still laugh with your friend Hilda at two in the morning and have joy. And that gives me a lot of hope, Marsha. I yeah, find yeah. it very, so I, that's what I answered this little boy, Travis, when he wrote to me, I said, you know, strangely meeting so many people in person and through their letters and memoirs, um, hearing these stories of how people, you know, life can be very challenging at times. Look at what we're living through right now. Yeah. So I learn a lot from how these people are able to, you know, fortify themselves and bravely persevere in the world because, you know. It's, it's um, also a um, catharsis. So it's a cathartic experience to read about something awful, but to come through it. And I so see. the people who actually suffered through that that they have been able to overcome it. Yeah. Um, they can experience true happiness in life because they know what the opposite is. And for readers, they can do a similar thing because they, they have gone through that experience in your books and they've come out the other side. And I think that you write very hopeful books always because it's about a triumph of a kid. A kid put in a daunting situation where they have um, reached deep inside of them and come up with the best that they can be. To overcome that situation and who wouldn't want to if they were capable like you to write that I think that many people would not very many people can do it but you can so and it's a gift to readers and you make so many readers I have recommended your books to so many people because I see so you know, when I do, <laughs> well when I do presentations I see kids that I see myself and oftentimes even I'm doing a zoom thing and the teacher will say I have someone who'd like to speak to you after, and it'll be someone who is dyslexic. And it's really important for someone like that to know that there's a whole pile of books that they can read that um, have patterning there that are very respectful. And so like, there's, there's just so much about what you do that I love. It's, there's just so much respect. It just emanates from your writing. Well, thank you so much. And you know, I feel exactly the same way. And I just can't wait for this, you know, this, you've just, your body of work is just incredible. And I really could, I would love to have many hours of just hearing about your process and your work, but I think that we're, it's time for us to take some questions. I'm okay. looking at this true. I don't know if, if Patricia was going to come back. Is this true, Patricia? It, it is <laughs> true. It right is. Thing? It's a historical fact. <laughs> I, will verify. I, I will verify what did ronald reagan say trust but verify <laughs> you can trust and i verify very good well, we feel like we're in extremely good hands i'm so glad uh the the history person in me uh is just gobbling up every bit of this conversation and i want to thank you so much for bringing history alive to young readers because I, I think history is not a corpse. It's, it's a living, breathing entity. It changes and grows. And I thank you for uh, giving the breath of life to history. Both of you really appreciate that. And it, it shows in your conversation and your enthusiasm and compassion for, for your readers. We have a question and a comment uh, from Judy uh, Nuremberg, and uh, she says, is this for Lauren? Do you think that your own children will take up writing? Hi, Judy. Um, you know, it's funny. I'm not sure. I think um, my, uh, I did not write my first book until I was, well, I tried to, but my first book for kids took about, I, I'd spent about 10 years learning how to write a novel. And then my first book was published when I was 42 years old. So I feel like I, I, I always tell kids, I love to tell that to kids. 
And I, I always say to them, you have a long time to figure out, you know, what you're, you know, what, what you love to do. And then once you figure out what you love to do to, to, to just to, to, to get better at it so that you can do it in different ways. So I have four children and they're, my youngest is 17. My oldest is 31. I have a grandson now um, who's four months. So um, I'm very eager to see, you know, they're, they're all doing different things. And um I, two of my kids, one is a doctor and two of them are storytellers in different ways um, in video. And my daughter Val is now writing her college essay. (laughs) So I'm not sure it it remains to be seen what she'll do. Okay. So uh, Marcia, do you have any writers besides yourself in the family? Uh, Well, my, my son is a software um, developer. So he claims that he writes novels with, you know, code but I don't believe them. <laughs> um, my, my older sister is a, um, a university professor. She's a professor of nursing. So she's written a whole ton of textbooks. So I, you know, that counts. And my father is a storyteller. So uh, my father has told so many stories. My dad's 93 and um, he just has this encyclopedic knowledge of everything that you can possibly imagine. So I use him um, to like bounce stories off on an ongoing basis, but other than that no um and um lauren my first book came out when i was 42 look at us we are this is scary marcia we are like we are there really is well my dad was a writer when i was growing up and um my dad would be the first i was with him today my parents live about 10 minutes from here my father and i have my dad's typewriter upstairs i i like to lug it out for kids but i'm um on zoom but the the, my dad would be the first to tell you that it was not a very good way of earning a living. My mom yes. was a teacher and that's what really supported us. My dad wrote articles and he wrote a lot about sports and travel, but the sound of that typewriter, my brother and I were just talking. My dad worked at home, which was very weird. No one had a dad who worked at home. We lived in the teeniest house in our town. He had this messy little office filled with apple cores and half drunk coffees with scary things growing in them. But I just loved, you know, I loved the feeling in that office, the shag carpeting (laughs) and the sound of the typewriter was this ever present music in our house. You could even hear it when we would walk back from the bus, he would, he would work with his window cracked open, even in the winter. And it would just be this type to type to type, ding, type to type to type, ding, type to type. And my friends, some friends would sleep over and they'd go, can you, (laughs) you know, it's six in the morning, midnight. Like I didn't even really hear it. It would lull me to sleep and it would lure me awake. So that I think, so, so, and I wonder with my own kids, if that memory, cause I'm always working in the sound of my, you know, they, like, you know, that I do think that that we soak that in. And I think that what Marsha and I both also, I will speak for you if it's okay. And I'm sure you share this with your son and is that I always have interesting, I'm always like, I've so like, I'm just at the end of a day of, of research, I'm just bursting with things to share and people I've talked to, the research trips, um, little tidbits about, oh my gosh, you're not gonna believe this about, you know, an avalanche that I'm now researching in the Cascade Mountains or a type of train. Did you know that in trains, you know, these beautiful, elegant, you could have your own private car, like a private jet, you know? So um, I do wonder if that will influence them because we're very fortunate to be doing work that we love and you're doing that too patricia so that to me is the message is to be fortunate enough because very few people are fortunate right. enough to work and to be able to spend every day doing something that means something to them yeah so, to be doing the thing that you love and actually get paid for it is yeah. um, a really yeah. remarkable thing it is it is when when you think about trying to re- recreate a sense of place and I think that uh, you t- both have talked about the, the area, going to the place, knowing a place, growing up in a place. When, um, I used to live in Texas. And so I, Galveston is in the memory of Texans. <laughs> There's a lot of things that are in that memory. And I think for Ukraine, uh, we, we uh, those of us who uh, watch a lot of news and have watched what's happened with Ukraine and uh, revolution and suppression and repression and the problems with Russia, and that's putting it mildly. How do you, how do you create a sense of place? 
And what's it like to go to a place where you know something either dreadful or monumental too has happened? Marcia, well, I'm dying um, to know that from you. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I try to do, um, and it's because I don't know where to start a book ever, but I'll take my character through a typical 24 hour day before it all changed. And so it, it's, it's almost like a tedious exercise where I'm brainstorming every single hour of the day, even minute of the day that the character goes through. And the way that I recreate that is um, I try to interview someone who has been at that, that exact same place and try to get them. I have research techniques, interview techniques, because I'm interviewing people who don't have not shared their stories, even with their own families. Um, so I recreate that day and then I recreate another day of after it changed, like after that happened. And then by doing that, I almost have all the scenes for the book. <laughs> like I don't use them in that order and um, they're reworked, but it just, it just informs you because like, if you think of even someone getting up in the morning, if they're, um, if it's Lida from making bombs for Hitler and she's in um, the, the slave camp, when she gets up in the morning on that barrack slat, it's different than when I get up in the morning, you know? Um, so that sets the scene for you. And so it's just the tiny little things that you wouldn't even think about asking if you didn't put yourself into those situations. And so a lot of my books actually end up starting like that, like Traders Among Us started when they're just laying down in the barracks. And um, uh, Don't Tell the Nazis started the same way. It was Christia and Maria in bed trying to go to sleep as they can hear um, people fighting outside. And it turns out that a whole people, bunch of people have been massacred. Um, so that's how I do it. And I wanna hear how Lauren does it. Well, you know, I, this is, I don't know if this is a direct answer but I will share something that was really, I don't, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, Marcia. So I always, you know, I have a very specific time in my research process that I go to the places that I visit. Cause what I like to do is I try to do just enough research, you know, so I have my grounding and then I like to go and really discover a lot there. And then I come back. So I like to, it really to be nestled into the middle of my research process. Then I come back and I, so for Galveston, I had a trip all planned March of 2020. Oh. Um, and of course couldn't go. And right. we, I, then I thought, okay. And my book, you know, the tick, 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 tick. <laughs> um, so I couldn't go, um, so I had to pretty, I had to, luckily there's an incredible record of the Galveston hurricane and the Galveston history center is incredible. And there's so much, there's all this photography and stuff, but I didn't get to go until I was pretty, I was writing the book and, but I went and I had my, my brain was packed with images, you know, and, and then I'd filled in, you know, where I couldn't, you know, I'd sort of, spackled in, you know, in between the pictures I'd seen. And it was a very powerful experience to walk, you know, going. And I almost wonder if I would do, maybe that's the better way to do it because I was, it was, it was, it was this kind of magical experience almost to be, con I was constantly flitting back in my mind to the pictures I'd seen, the descriptions I've read. So I'm walking on Broadway and I'm imagining the water creeping up or I'm standing on the beach and I'm imagining, you know, the pounding waves or the bathhouses, beautiful bathhouses built out on the pier. So I don't know, but I think that to me, and um, this is certainly, I think, Marsha, I don't know if you'd put it this way, but I always have to remind myself that my, my place is a character in the book. So Galveston is a character. The city is a living, breathing being um, that has a personality that has things it wants <laughs> and needs and is, you know, and, um, and that's true of, you know, whether it's Mount St. Helens or if it's Boston, the molasses floods, certainly California, when I was writing about the wildfires, you know, so that that's, that's, um, and very often in the drafts that don't work for me, which are many, it's because if it's not too many characters, like my husband likes to remind me that I haven't brought the care, I haven't brought the setting to life in that way. I haven't made the setting um, a living, breathing um, character yet. That, that's a really good point. And I, I have the exact same 
problem and challenge. And because I write um, uh, historical fiction, like sometimes I will set a, um, a like a, a, a representative village. So I have to create it myself, whereas everything else is real, but like the village has to be representative, but I, because of confidentiality of the individual people, I have to create characters from those people. So I can't even have the same streets or anything. So I end up drawing them and uh, recreating them and collecting photographs and everything else, because if I can't see it, it can't come alive. Right. Um, and I wrote it, like the book that I'm struggling with right now, I wrote during the pandemic, which meant that I couldn't visit there. And um, also it was a part of Ukraine that I have not been to. And I've been all over Ukraine, but this particular book, I hadn't been there. And so I struggled with that a lot. And so, um, and it's the pandemic. And I, I mean, so um, I had to really rejig around my research. So actually on Saturday, I'm doing a, an SCBWI workshop locally for our local one um, about how to do research when you can't get to the library and or archives. Wow. Because like I, I was able to like MacGyver my way through it. So I was glad. <laughs> wow. Well, that's you have to be resourceful, right? It's almost like a, it, the the writer's version of what you you talked about, Marcia. Is I survived being a writer during the pandemic. During the pandemic, and also and like, how. <laughs> and um, I'm a librarian by profession. Uh, I was a librarian before I was a writer, and and it just drives me nuts when I hear people say, "Well, just Google it." Um, you know, that makes me want to slap them. <laughs> that's a that's a hard one to hear that uh yes. Yes, it's pain, painful to painful to hear that because yes. that's just problematic in so many ways so uh question about uh, upcoming books if you feel like talking a little bit more about them in that um will you how do you pick your next subjects or do they pick you I guess it could be that and a question from the audience is uh, specifically also for the I Survive uh, series what about World War One besides the molasses flood just to be clear thank you any- Patricia <laughs> that's right inside baseball I survived I feel <laughs> <laughs> and so your your question your your the person who posed the question is, all right, molasses flood, yes, but more World War One. I, I do think that that's probably, I'm going to, it's been hard because, I mean, another thing that is, is always a challenge for me is I have to make sure that I can get my character into the action, you know, so um, the question of, and I do think, you know, is it a child in a village? Is it, you know, it's one of those questions, but I do get that all the time. And World War One is, of course, so interesting. The one thing I would say is that I've written a lot about, you know, the sort of early 1900s. So one of the things I'm going to try to challenge myself to do is do like, I really would love to do, you know, the middle ages, um, you know, some of these, you know, I, I have a big gap between the eruption of Vesuvius in ancient Roman times and revolutionary war. So I have a lot of history to fill um, from that time, but I, I get a lot of, I'm, I'm very fortunate because I get a lot of my suggestions from my readers. Um, And that's really many of the topics are, I respond to their interests and um, they haven't really led me astray and they've led me to do a lot of type of topics I never thought I would take on like the Holocaust, frankly, like September 11th. Um, That was not my original plan to take on such enormous complicated topics, but to Marsha's point, these kids are curious and smart, and even kids who are not voracious readers want to know. Um, so I've expanded my sense of the series as a time has gone on to be that it's my role, not to be sound like grandiose or anything, but you know, it's my part of my job to take complicated topics like World War I and to make them accessible to, to young readers so that they can then go off and read Marsha's books or Alan's books or Deborah Hopkinson's books. You know, I have so many, I feel like I'm setting this stage to, for my, for my readers to be able to go off to see, read Steve Shankin's books, um, to read these glorious um, authors who are telling more complicated stories. Marsha, what's, uh, do you want to say a little more about maybe what's coming or, or don't give it away if you don't want to? 
well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about what I have written also, because I think most people in the U.S. know me mostly for my World War II novels. Um, but I've written 24 books. Like, this is my 24th book, um, Traitors Among Us. And my first books were set in World War I, actually. And um, I wrote um, a young adult series set in World War I about Armenian uh, survivors of the Armenian genocide, which happened in World War I. I've written other books about uh, Vietnamese refugees. And I wrote the very first picture book that was ever published to, from the perspective of a Vietnamese re refugee. Um, it's called uh, Adrift at Sea. Um, but I, I, I do like what Lauren does. Um, and that is find these stories that no one else is telling and tell them in a way that is very simple, but clear and historically accurate and with respect to the reader, but try and use as few words as possible. I'm not able to use as few words as Lauren in my novels. Darn it, <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> but you know, um, for me uh, to be able to take something as difficult as the Armenian genocide and to write novels about it, um, it's, it's very important to me. And so I'm actually considered an honorary Armenian and I'm wearing a gold coin that was presented to me by the Armenian community um, just in thanks because I've actually written more books on the Armenian genocide, more novels than anyone in the English speaking world. Wow. And I'm not Armenian, except for the coin. <laughs> That's... Well, I know we're, we're a little over time, but if, if the two of you wouldn't mind, I'd like to just uh, have a few, a uh, couple more questions if you have time. It's okay if we... Sure. Okay. Yes. All right. Marsha, this question is for you, and it's uh, from Savannah. And she said, I've emailed you before. I love to write, and I was wondering what your best advice would be. Your books really help me understand World War II better. Oh, isn't that lovely, Savannah? Thank you for that question. I have two suggestions. One is read a lot, and I know that you already do, Savannah, but try to read about a thousand books, a thousand novels if you can, and try and read as many different kinds as you can. And the reason for that is that if you try and write a book before you've read a whole whack of them, you'll just sound like the last person that you read. Um, the other thing that I would suggest is starting tonight, write for 10 minutes every single day. And don't share it with your teacher, don't share it with your parents necessarily, or your friends, because they may give you comments about it. It's not for anyone to tell you whether you're doing a good job. It's for you to learn how to write and for you to find your own voice in the safety of your own brain. But if you write for 10 minutes every day by the end of the year, what you have will be the size of a novel. It may not be a novel, but you will have changed your brain by just going through that exercise and you will become a writer by doing that. What great advice, Marsha. I'm gonna follow, excuse me, I have to go write my 10 minutes now. <laughs> I'll be right I'll back. Be back. Uh, <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> Is what great. is your advice, Lauren? I want to hear this. I love yours, Marcia. I, I'll share, this sounds, I'll share JK Rowling's advice because I got to meet her um, at the Scholastic offices because of my role in magazines many years ago before her books were, you know, her books, they were, and she gave some great advice. I said to her, you know, kind of like after people left and I had my like 30 second private thing, I said, you know, Joe, I loved your book so much. And she said, oh, thank you. And I said, and I can't believe it was your first book. And she said, it wasn't my first book. She sounds nothing like that. And then she, I said, um, really? And she said, yes, I've written two other books. And I said, well, I'm dying to read them. What are they called? And she said, oh, they're locked in a drawer. No one has ever read those books. So I said, really? And she goes, yes. I said, why? And she said, because they're dreadful. And then she said the words that I like to share with every young water, you know, she said, don't you think a person has to write at least two bad books before they can write a good book? And I was so excited to hear that because I had already written the worst book ever and I had given up. I thought, well, that is it. And the fact that she actually expressed the idea that, that, the journey of becoming a writer means just like what you said, Marsha is writing and that you don't judge. I, and I, that I've taken that so to heart that I no longer get, I mean, I certainly get frustrated when I write my terrible drafts of I survived and it's just the character's ridiculous and the action is dull and it makes no sense. And there's some like crazy animal in there. Cause I can't think of anything else, you know? Um, but then I think of those advice and I think, well, this is part of, 
you know, this is just part of the journey, you know, that I, this, I had to do, I have to do this in order to do that. So that's my, I'm just, I'm just sharing. That's so good. I like that. I like it too. I really do. I have heard that before. David Joy, who's a regional author here, he he mentioned that there's a draft of something that will never see the light of day. That I think was the first thing he wrote. And he just, he won't discuss it any further, but he just <laughs> says, that's not going to get out there. There's no, there, that is uh, buried in a lockbox somewhere, never to be seen again. And, you know, that, yeah, I think that's a, uh, that, that helps us take heart that it's okay to wade through the bad to uncover the good. And, and well, yeah, you got to write crap before you can write anything good. Right. I right. So. And I, I always tell kids that I really, I mean, I have no talent at all in anything. My parents will be the first to tell you that they're like, they're shocked. Everyone, they're astonished to that. I get to find myself with people like Patricia and Marsha and, you know, in a, in a nice way. But, and I say to kids like, you know, are, who raise your hand if you, you know, you love to, you know, love to dance, you play lacrosse, you love to cook. You, well, writing is no different. If you like, it's a craft, it's something you get better at if you practice and if you, are, you, are you commit to it and you try to learn from other people, the way you learn, watch, you know, you watch Steph Curry do his layups and basketball. I don't know if you guys are basketball and you can pause them and go out to your driveway. That's what my sons did. That's how they became good basketball players. So I think that, that, that kids today are put on, under so much pressure to distinguish themselves at an early age. I'm in the travel this, or I'm in the gifted that, or mm -hmm. I'm in the regional orchestra. I was selected and it's like, you know, you're nine. <laughs> and it's, and it's all for performing for other yes. people. Yes. And really um, yes. so much that if you were just able to do it and not show it to anyone, it yes. would be so much better. I, um, I get frustrated when I hear parents ask um, how they should, uh, my advice about getting their kids published and I say, please don't do that. Like that's too much pressure for kids. Um, let them enjoy the process and let them read books. But I was 42 when I had my first book published and I'm glad that I had that much time to make um, a lot of mistakes because it does take a long time. And like you wouldn't encourage a nine-year-old who wanted to become a veterinarian to operate on your cat. <laughs> So like, why are we encouraging kids idea. to try and publish when they're nine years old? It's, it's not right. I know. Well, I, I love that, that uh, analogy a lot. That's excellent. I'm going to steal a, that from you, Marsha. That's a good one. <laughs> I, um, I'm thinking that uh, I know that, that you all have so many things that you're doing, but if the two of you could collaborate on a book, or at least do a short podcast together, uh, many of us would really appreciate it because I think we've really only gotten to the surface of what, you know, uh, they say. See all these questions. I know. Uh, it's the beginning yeah. of a beautiful friendship. I mean, y'all are already friends, uh -huh. I know, but I just think there's so much more there in your uh you, that's that's what's so wonderful about author events and I know that our audience has really appreciated it and this is really what what independent bookstores are all about too is hoping that when people come together there's a kind of the the sparks fly and there's something unique and as a lover of history I'm deeply inspired by your stories and your craft and I want to thank you both so much for really sharing not just the the ups but the struggle because it's in the struggle that it seems like the two of you write you writing in the struggle but the coming out of that and then what that makes a person and it seems like you have so much I think you've got so much more to teach us uh, young young and not so young it doesn't matter it seems like the message is always room to learn and grow and I, I certainly am so appreciative of your time this evening. Well, it's thank you. And I, I so much appreciate it learning from Lauren. Well, <sighs> I feel the same. And I feel, you know, so grateful, Patricia, you know, just the idea that I love this idea of your, the bookstore being founded 39 years ago as a, as this place, these, and so it's such, there's such treasures and Asheville is so lucky to have you. I can't wait to come there. Finally, you know, I've never been to, to Asheville. I've heard it so 
incredible. So I will be coming at some point. I will storm in. Maybe Marcia and I will come together. <laughs> We're oh, here. <laughs> great. And then you must please tell me because I will give you some advance notice. We will. Give, we'll give, give you at least notice. a day. <laughs> please, because I think it's a, it would just be a, a seminal event. Well, and, and also the cocoa. Oh, well, the yeah, cocoa. Yeah. Oh, that's right. We'll or a bottle of wine. So a bottle of wine sounds good, too. <laughs> okay. Well, I again, I want to thank you both so much for being here with us this evening. We've been, uh, I'm humbled to have just been able to listen to Lauren Tarsius talk about her latest book, I Survived the Galveston Hurricane, 1900. And then, of course, Marsha, I'm going to get it right where my paper go. Scripic. Did I say it right? You did. Yay. And her latest book, Traders Among Us. You've been in the presence of two great conversationalists, authors, lovers of history, and respecters of the readers. And uh, I hope that if you didn't get a chance to hear this, or if you want to come back, then please use the same link that you used to join us this evening. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you, Lauren. Everyone, have a great evening. Night, everyone. Thank you. For Night. Great to see you, Marcia. Wonderful to Be see continued. you. Continued. Yes. <laughs>